Good morning. Between uh, breakfast and music, uh, I think we have full stomachs and full hearts, and we can just go home now, right? I ran across a video of a graffiti artist uh, recently, and he covers expletives and other unwanted tagging with whimsical illustrations, usually of food. And it's a lovely way to bring joy into a space where people have brought hate. And often he has to go back two or three times, you know, he'll have one video and he'll, he'll do um, a slice of pizza or a slice of watermelon. And then you'll see in the next video that someone has tagged that painting and he has to go and paint over it once again with another painting to keep that space joyful. In general, I am not a big fan of graffiti. I know you'll find that shocking. But there's one piece of graffiti that I am glad exists. It is called the Alexemenos Graffito. And it is originally, it was originally scratched into a plaster wall in Rome and now resides in the British Museum. This crude drawing is meant to depict Jesus, a donkey-headed God hanging on a cross, being worshipped. It's thought to have been carved around 200 AD and is the earliest known pictorial representation of the crucifixion. The Greek inscription below it mocks both God and the Christian. Alexemenos worships his God. We know that until Emperor Constantine adopts the Christian faith in the 4th century, Christians preferred to use symbols other than the cross to represent their faith, such as Christ's initials or a fish. They saw the cross as an emblem of shame, a shameful death for their Lord, the way that criminals were executed. It was not Jesus' death on the cross, but his resurrection that was proudly celebrated by followers of Christ. We, as Christians, as Seventh-day Adventists, celebrate Christmas, well, we look around, right? We see Christmas trees and wreaths, decorations, Christmas music, the manger. We don't always do so well celebrating the empty tomb. But those two things, the full manger and the empty tomb, are inextricably linked. You cannot have one without the other. In our Christmas journey so Far, we have met unprepared parents who taught us to meet surprise with surrender, to react in willingness and in obedient faith. We have met spiritually searching magi who were open to other perspectives while following God's leading, seeking, and worshiping. And we have met awe filled shepherds who humbly acted on their faith, did faith, and shared their joy. And now we turn towards the manger, the baby himself, the full manger that has to precede the empty tomb. Luke writes, In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to a son, her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. It is a story we are familiar with. 
we see the nativity scenes this time of year. We read the books and watch the plays and skits. We hear the songs. And all too often, I think, because we know the story, it doesn't touch our lives. We don't stop to examine or think about it too hard. So today, I want us to take a slightly different approach, to look at the story of Jesus' birth in light of his death, not as a standalone event, but his life as a whole, the bookends, his birth and his death. It's as if we have picked up a book and chosen to read the last chapter at the same time as the first. There are a lot of parallels between the accounts of Jesus' birth and death. So we're going to run through a few of those, and I'm going to do something that I usually avoid. I'm going to assume that you know these stories, that you are familiar with them. And if I lose you, I apologize in advance. I have included textual references, so if I lose you, Remember that and go read it because they are wonderful stories. I am focusing on Luke and Matthew because Luke is my favorite gospel, at least one of my four favorite gospels. And um, because Luke and Matthew have the clearest accounts of Jesus' birth. So I'm sticking with those two, not because they're the only ones or the best ones, but simply for the sake of time and space in slides. So we're sticking mostly with Matthew and Luke. Let's look at some of these parallels. In both stories, we have a lot of angels that show up. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, angels haven't shown up much in my life. There are a few times when uh, there have been people who've shown up in my life, and I think, well, maybe that was just a a very lovely, godly person, and maybe that was an angel. But angels show up and are clearly angels. Zechariah, Mary, Joseph, the wise men, shepherds, all have encounters that we are told about with angels. And then, as we look at that empty tomb, the women come to the tomb expecting to find it full, and what do they find? They find it empty. They find the stone rolled away and an angel sitting there waiting to tell them, he is not here, he is risen. Very clear, angelic moments. We do not expect angelic visits in our everyday life, do we? I don't. The wise men and Joseph have dreams. Angels show up to them, not physically, not in person, but in dreams. There's a book that I think I've talked to you guys about before. It's uh, titled, I Dared to Call Him Father. And in it, the, uh, the author prays for guidance on multiple occasions and receives it, often in the form of dreams. And it has me wondering if our stories are limited by our expectations. I think we should ask God to guide our lives even in dreams, even in angelic encounters. Another parallel we see is we see this this talking about strips of cloth, that she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in the manger. And we see that same idea that they wrap him in a cloth and stick him in the tomb. So in birth, both birth and in death, we see strips of cloth. We also see spices. The wise men bring these beautiful, expensive spices. And then Jesus' feet are anointed. And he says, she has done this in preparation for my burial. And then the women go taking spices with them to anoint and prepare his body, and they find the empty tomb. In both Jesus' birth and in his death, he is aided by wealthy patrons. There are rich men who come to his aid 
we have the wise men, the magi, who bring gifts that probably help Mary and Joseph and Jesus be able to live as they head to Egypt in exile. And then we have Joseph of Arimathea who goes and pleads to be given Jesus' body and he lays it in his own tomb. He takes care of Jesus. Jesus is not wealthy. He comes from humble beginnings. And we see that throughout his life, but especially at the bookends. We see that both his birth and his death come as a shock. It is unexpected. It is not met with joyful tidings. Women herald his birth and his death. You have Elizabeth and Mary who sing songs to God, who testify to his goodness in this unexpected pregnancy. And at the end of his life, it is the women and Mary Magdalene and Joanna who stand by him, who are there as he is laid in the tomb, and who go back to take care of his body. And there are donkeys. We always assume there's, there's no actual place where it states in Scripture, and Mary rode to Bethlehem on a donkey. But we kind of assume that, probably because we don't like to think of a seven- or eight-month-old pregnant woman walking 95 miles. <laughs> so we assume that there's a donkey on the trip to Bethlehem. And then at the end of his life, that last week of life, Jesus rides a donkey into Jerusalem in the triumphal entry, showing that he is king and savior and Lord. We see that the religious people of his time are clueless. They are unaware Herod and his scholars have to be told by the magi, by foreigners, hey, the time is right, what do your scriptures say? And it's only at the prompting of foreigners that they go and examine their own scriptures and come to the conclusion, yes, it is time for the Savior to be born, and he is to be born in Bethlehem. And it is the religious voices of their day that call the loudest for Jesus' crucifixion. In both the first and last stories surrounding Jesus' life, Jesus exists in borrowed spaces. There's this Greek word, kataluma. It's the same word that is used when we talk of there was no space in the inn or in the guest room. The upper room is how it literally translates. And that's the same word that is used with the Last Supper when Jesus commands his disciples to go and find a certain man and follow him and tell him the Lord has need of your space and he will take you to a furnished upper room, a furnished guest room. It's only translated in because of tradition. But it's the same word, the upper room. The way that houses are built, they have three levels. The lowest level where the animals come in when it's cold. A slightly higher level where the family lives and works. And in wealthy homes, one more level, a special level reserved for parties and for guests who come from out of town. So when we say there was no room in the guest room, there was no room in the home of his family. And so they laid him in the manger. A borrowed space. A borrowed space where he breathes his first. A borrowed space where he eats his last. And a borrowed space where he is laid to rest in death. I want us to stay there for a second. Because I think this idea of Jesus existing in a borrowed space is powerful. All spaces belong to God, but he has gifted some of them to us. But we see that here he asks to borrow them back. He asks for them to be put into use for him. 
So I want you to imagine a scene with me. It's the holidays. Can you imagine it? Family comes to visit. There's a few more people than we expected. The plane tickets were available last minute. And we freely give up our space. The kids bunk together or they sleep on the living room floor in bunk beds, while family members who are wiser and older take over their beds. Borrowed spaces can be a blessing. God asks us to let him borrow our hearts. Our lives are already a gift from God, but we are asked to give that space back to let God borrow it and take up residence within us. So in a sense, we both live in a borrowed borrowed space and we give God the privilege of borrowing our hearts. Matthew chapter 1 says, She will give birth to a son. And you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. Why don't you read verse 23 with me? The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. God was with us in the manger. He was with us on the cross. He is with us today. In a room adjoining the space where the Alexamenos Graffito was found, mocking Alexamenos for his faith in Jesus, we find another piece of graffiti, this time in Latin. Alexamenos Fidelis. Alexamenos, the faithful. When we have loaned our hearts back to Jesus, mockery doesn't matter, but faithfulness does. It is because of Jesus' gift of himself on the cross that we are able to enter into the Christmas story. It is because of the empty tomb that we celebrate the full manger. Would you bow your heads? Father, today we praise you for being Emmanuel, for being God with us. We praise you not only for the baby in a manger, but for an empty tomb. We praise you for being our incarnate risen Lord who knows us and loves us. And today, Lord, we thank you for letting us borrow ourselves, for letting us borrow so many gifts from you. And we ask how we can give them back. As we look at that manger this week, Lord, as we celebrate the baby in it, we remember the empty tomb and praise you for being the God of both. Amen.